Hello, I'm Susie T. Kane. I hope you don't think me pompous for including my middle initial for my maiden name, Toonie. It turns out that I'm not the only Susie Kane in the world with the same spelling. But hey, I think I'm now the only one with the middle initial T. My wanting to write Little Tin Heart a memoir was not so much a conscious decision as an inner imperative from what must be a branch office of my brain somewhere else in my body. When I was a senior in high school, a reporter for our school paper interviewed some of us for a story on our plans after graduation. When he asked me what I wanted to be, I answered immediately, a writer, even though there was absolutely nothing in my academic record to indicate my ambition. On my next stop in college, getting several poems published in the university literary magazine was encouraging, but I became what was a newly coined term at the time, a college dropout, and went to secretarial school as a way to support myself. And as an aside, I, I was fortunate to be able to go back for my degree when our children were in school full time. So at 19, I started work as a secretary in the advertising sales department of Time Magazine in New York. I would later, later take evening writing classes at the New School, where my poems were published in two New School anthologies. But here's an example of how strange my goal to write was, even to myself. While working as a secretary, I sent off for the guidelines to apply for a writing grant offered by a foundation. When I received the, its application form, I began filling it out right away until I came to a requirement that stopped me in my tracks. Describe your writing project. Writing project? I didn't have a clue. I just knew there was something I was supposed to be writing and if some tr as if some truth were trying to get my attention. Of course, I could not complete the application. And worse, at the back of my mind, I began to doubt myself, wondering if I was like the woman who wanted to be an opera singer but couldn't carry a tune. Still working as a secretary, I moved to the promotion department of Life magazine. And when a job for a copywriter opened up, I applied. I don't think you could do this today, Actually, you really couldn't do it then. But using my poems as my writing portfolio, I luckily got the job. To an insecure ego, getting a paycheck for writing was a meaningful validation of my desire to be a writer. And writing promotion copy was a great writing school. Fiction was not in my future. I don't like making things up. I'm, I'm more interested in what is true, that is, I mean, what actually happened. I know fiction can be true, too, but that's a different discussion. What was the truth about my family? Was there a secret I could not articulate but only sense? My mother, from pioneer American stock, grew up in the little town of, in the Ozarks of Missouri. Her forebears fought for the Confederacy. My father, an Arab, grew up in Iraq, where I and my younger brother were also born. I started kindergarten and grew up in Montclair, New Jersey, a suburb of New York, yet a third culture. From such disparate backgrounds, how did my parents meet and how did we all get along? I had a lot of questions. Why did the family myth of my parents' fairy tale elopement after knowing each other only three days make all the, the uh, major American newspapers, including the front page of the New York Daily Mirror? I did not actually construct such a sentence to myself as a child. It was more a felt question. I accepted my mother's explanation that her running away with my father was love at first sight. Why did my mother keep me at arm's length? 
Again, this is not a question I could articulate as a child. As an adult, learning how important touch is to human beings, I wondered why she, she drilled into me that I did not like to be touched. And why did my father become so strict? Was my parents' behavior based on culture, gender, or craziness? What pain did my mother so unsuccessfully try to medicate when she started drinking? I had not yet learned that those who do not suffer their own suffering are bound to inflict it on others. This is one way that buried secrets work their way to the the surface. My memoir is about my memories of my parents, but I start with biography to provide you, the reader, background of who my parents were before I came along to remember them. You will have the advantage of knowing more about them than I knew as a child growing up. History morphs into memoir after I'm born into the story. I have a passion for writing in the, because in the act of writing, I don't have to remind myself that passion involves suffering, as in the story of Jacob wrestling all night with the angel who dislocates Jacob's thigh before giving him his blessing. I've had just enough transcendent moments in writing to keep me coming back but just as often I felt I was wrestling with that powerful and, yes, scary angel in writing Little Tin Heart. One kind of transcendent moment I often experienced was after I started writing at, say, 9 p.m. and happened to glance at the clock again to discover it was 2 a.m. I was so engaged in what I was writing that I completely lost track of time. I was, it, I was in another realm. I found synchronicity transcendent too. A concept introduced by the psychologist Carl Jung, synchronicity might be called just a coincidence by some, but a meaningful co- coincidence by others like me. When I first started writing about my time with my parents, There was no Google, no internet. I was working, I was writing then about my father's bubblegum factory and wanted to compare it to the palatial size chewing gum factory we always drove by when we went to my grandparents' house for Sunday dinner. But I could not remember the name of the company or the gum it made or where exactly it was located. I didn't know where to start looking for the information I wanted and thought I might go to our local library the next day for suggestions. We lived in northern Westchester County then, and had the New York Times thrown onto our driveway every morning. The next day, as as usual, once our boys were off to school, I spread open the newspaper on our kitchen counter to scan the news. Racing through it, when I came to the business section, a huge photograph of a building that had been been sold caught my eye. It was a picture of the old American Chickle Company that made Chicklet's gum located in the Queens Borough of New York. All the information I wanted right in the photo caption. Just a coincidence? I interpreted the coincidence as a meaningful prod from the universe to keep going with my book. My friend Maggie, whom I've known since junior high school, was administrator of an historical association museum and bookstore in Lake George, New York. She chatted one day with a museum goer who introduced himself as Chuck Gosselink. He told her he had written a history about the properties and, and their owners in a Bay Area on northern Lake George. He said he spent the summers on the Penfield property there with his wife, Charlotte, who was a Penfield, explaining that he did not spend summers there in his youth as she did because he'd grown up in Iraq. Maggie commented, I know a friend whose father was from Iraq, the only only Iraqi I know, who went to the University of Michigan. Oh, he replied, You must mean the Tooney brothers. 
Maggie was stunned. She telephoned me in Taos, New Mexico, where my husband and I were living at the time, and gave me Chuck's email. Of course I contacted him, and since then we've become friends. Synchronicity within synchronicity. Chuck is the son of my father's English teacher in Iraq. What are the odds of such a double coincidence? When I look up at the shelves of books lining my office, I do not see books, but people. Persons alone at their desks, alone with their own thoughts. Here, I hope the person behind the print will tell me, here is something I have found out worth your knowing. In books, I've received not only solace, but strangely synchronistic encouragement. That is, books have somehow found their way into my hands just when I needed them at just the right time. The original virtual reality is vicarious experience in reading. I want to see what life is like in somebody else's shoes, somebody who may be in a different universe of experience. I want to see how people live and to learn what, what issues they confront and what obstacles they run into and how they overcome them or not. Book in hand, we have the amazing opportunity to learn the wisdom of people we would otherwise never have had the chance to meet. Writing for me is also an aesthetic experience. W.H. Auden said a poet is someone who likes to hang around words, something I like to do too. When someone speaks or writes clearly, to me their words are like beautiful music. In the act of writing on those satisfying occasions when at least I believe I've expressed what I mean, I feel as if my writing and typing fingers are hollow flutes out of which pour sweet notes. Ultimately, I can say I've been saved by the word, which in the translation of the New English Bible is meditatively capitalized. When all things began, opens the book of John, the word already was. The word dwelt with God, and what God was, the word was. So beautifully weird, isn't it? The Buddhist koan is a, a riddle meant to take the meditator to fresh understanding. As I pondered the koan, what is the sound of one hand clapping? An answer came to me. The sound of one hand clapping is a writer without a reader. The necessity of the reader to the writer reveals the equality in their relationship. I hope little tin heart draws you in and speaks to you. And while you're reading it, I hope you're so engrossed, you forget your reading. Bye.